Now, the word Sabbath is not a word that people would very often hear in their day-to-day business. So it came as quite a surprise when I did hear it on the national news this week, although not in any way associated with really what we'll be considering tonight. Ozzy Osbourne, who I'll describe as an alternative musical artist, has decided to retire. His band was called Black Sabbath, a name obviously chosen to get a reaction as their music was far from religious. But fret not, the Sabbath we'll be looking at tonight will have nothing to do with Ozzy Osbourne anymore. I only brought it up as it was quite the coincidence hearing the word Sabbath this week as I was driving around and thinking about the talk. The Sabbath we'll be looking at tonight is a very interesting topic. The Sabbath is something that was first alluded to in Genesis, the first book of the Bible. It was also a part of the Ten Commandments and the law. And I put it to you that it can also project our thoughts into the future, the time of the kingdom of God, soon to be on earth when Christ returns. The Sabbath has been in the worship of the Jewish people literally for thousands of years, and even today the Jews will still keep the Sabbath. Traditionally, it's a time to open the home to the needy and to share a meal, often a meal of bread and wine, and also to share the word of God with them. It's a time to rest and freshen up and spend time reading and understanding the Torah and learning and practicing the laws of the Torah in your life and that of your family. The Sabbath is also of particular importance to the Seventh-day Adventists, a Christian group who make a strong point of worshipping on Saturday, not Sunday, as many other Christian denominations would do. These two religious groups are the main people who would focus on the Sabbath, and they would both suggest that we should keep the Sabbath even today. Tonight we're going to look at what the Bible says about the Sabbath, looking at both the Old and the New Testament, looking at the teaching from the law, and also looking at the teachings from Christ. From this we'll be able to find out what the Sabbath is and what it is not. But for now, what is the Sabbath? The Hebrew word Sabbath or Shabbat literally means rest or cessation, as in a cessation from working. The Sabbath is the last or seventh day of the Jewish week. As you may be aware, the Sabbath, like all Jewish days, begins at sunset rather than the day starting at midnight as we do with our time scale. So for us, the Sabbath begins on effectively Friday evening at sunset and then finishes on Saturday evening again at sunset. The reason why the Jews run their calendar from sunset to sunset lies in the record of creation in Genesis chapter 1. If we could all please turn there right at the start of the Bible. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 5, we read this in our English. So the evening and the morning were the first day. However, I'm told this is not entirely correct according to the original Jewish translation. Apparently, this section could be better translated. So there was evening and there was morning one day. So from this, the Jews infer the day begins with evening, that is, at sunset. Now, it was God, the creator of the universe, who introduced the symbol of the Sabbath. God, after six days of creation, rested on the seventh day. That's recorded in Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Now, God has unlimited energy, so he didn't rest because the work of creation had exhausted him. There was something much deeper than that, which we'll be discussing later on tonight. I'd just like you to note some careful reading here, though, in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 2. Reading along. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Now if we jump to verse 8 for context, we read that the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. There he put the man whom he had formed. And verse 15, then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. So careful reading here shows that man was meant to be tending the garden. This was, after all, the day after he'd been created. There's no initial mention in the Genesis record of Adam being commanded to rest on that first Sabbath day. It was only God. And I mention this as the Seventh-day Adventists would say that the Sabbath laws were introduced at creation, and that justifies their ongoing worship today. But the Bible only mentions the rest for God. Now, have you ever wondered why it is that we have seven days in our week? It's not really the easiest number for us to divide up. 
Now, granted, the lunar cycle of the moon is about 28 days, so four weeks is close to a lunar cycle, but it is still an unusual number. Babylonian, Greek, and Roman archaeology shows that they all followed a seven-day week, and I believe it points back to the seven-day creation record. Now, the Bible only refers to the days of the week by their number, the first day, and so on, with the exception of the seventh day, which is given the special name of the Sabbath. But throughout history, the days have been given other names. The Greeks and Romans gave them the names of their gods, but were also linked to celestial beings, such as the sun, moon, and some of the planets. There was Mars, the god of war, Mercurius, the messenger of the gods. Then other nationalities took these and tweaked them a little bit. And for some reason, the English words that we use today came as a mixture of some celestial beings and a few Norse gods. So we have Sunday after the sun, moon day, Monday. Wednesday is Woden's day, and then there's Thor's day. And by the way, I included some of these graphical representations for um, some of our younger members to show that there's nothing new under the sun, even in the Marvel Universe. Even in other languages, there are links. For example, Monday in French is Lundi, and that can literally be translated as Day of the Moon. And you note the lunar reference, Lundi, lunar, likely from the Latin. But these meanings are really lost in our modern world. Monday isn't considered the day that we worship the moon. To most, it's just the start of the work week. Most people wouldn't think of Saturday as something to do with the planet Saturn, nor would they think of it as a Sabbath. It's just Saturday. So what do we learn about the Sabbath from the Bible? Where is it mentioned next? Well, there's a brief mention of it in the time when God provided manna, the food for the people of Israel in the wilderness. But the next time it's mentioned is in the Ten Commandments, when God gave the law at Mount Sinai. We may know of the Ten Commandments that were written on tables of stone and given to Moses. Well, of these Ten Commandments, number four was, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And that's recorded in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 8. So the people of Israel were commanded by God to remember the Sabbath. But remembering means much more than merely not forgetting to observe the Sabbath. It meant that they had to remember the significance behind the Sabbath. Now, this significance came in two parts. The first part is found in Exodus 31, verse 13. If we could turn there, please. The first part was a religious commemoration. The children of Israel were to remember the fact that God was the creator of all the earth and that they were to use the Sabbath day as a time to reflect on how great God is and what he'd done for them. So then reading from Exodus 31, verse 13. Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep. It is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. For whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh is a Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Now you'd have noticed from my emphasis that there were two important points repeated throughout those verses. One of them was that the Sabbath was specifically for the children of Israel, for the Jews. It's not recorded as it being for all of mankind or something for everyone, but rather specifically for the Jews. The second point was that the only punishment ever mentioned for breaking the Sabbath was death. In the book of Numbers in chapter 15, we read the story of a man who was caught collecting sticks on the Sabbath, and he was put to death. So it was a law that meant business. It wasn't a law to be trifled with. The second part of the Sabbath was recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 12 to 15. If you could please turn there now. The second part of the Sabbath was the blessing that it gave them in that they were forced not to, to not work, thus giving them time to recover from a hard week of work and to be able to enjoy their time with their family. 
Now, in Deuteronomy 5, Moses reiterates the Ten Commandments, and he notes the second thing that the people of Israel had to remember about the Sabbath. So Deuteronomy 5, verse 12 to 15, Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. And remember, in verse 15, that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So you'll note there the particular emphasis on the fact that everyone in Israel, especially the servants and slaves, had to rest on that day. This gave a clear social benefit for everyone in the nation, but there's also another important underlying reasons for that law. By keeping the Sabbath, there would be a weekly reminder of the nation's redemption from Egypt. They were to be merciful to their servants because God had showed great mercy to them when he freed them from slavery to Pharaoh. Now, the Bible is a book full of symbols. This freedom of the nation of Israel from Egypt was a symbol of the nation's freedom from sin and its power. They were no longer forced slaves serving Egypt as their master. The Sabbath day was a day where they were meant to choose to serve God. They weren't to serve sin. They weren't to serve masters. They weren't even to serve themselves, but rather it was a day to remove their burdens and to give themselves completely to God. So while the Sabbath was primarily a religious day, it was also intended by God to be a day of rest, particularly for the slaves. So before we go on, let's summarise the Old Testament teaching. Firstly, the seven-day week comes from the creation record. Second, the Sabbath was for the nation of Israel. Third, God wanted the Sabbath to be a holy day. And from that you can see how we get holiday out of that word. But it was a holy day. The Sabbath, meaning cessation or rest, was to be observed by the Israelites and especially any slaves, refraining from everyday tasks in order to enjoy and remember God's blessings. Under the Jewish law, the penalty for defiling the Sabbath was death. The Sabbath was designed by God to teach Israel about their special national relationship to him and of his great mercy in freeing them from Egyptian slavery. And it was to be a weekly remembrance of the nation's redemption. Now, God had given some basic laws regarding the Sabbath that the people were to keep. But the children of Israel, as they often did, wanted to make it better. They liked the idea of these laws as they were easy to do and they were easy to be seen doing. And soon it wasn't enough just to do the basic laws. So they invented a system of minute and burdensome extra laws and regulations. And meanwhile, the higher purpose of the Sabbath was lost sight of. In the end, the less one did, almost the more holy they became. So they ended up doing less and less until they soon became effectively useless to anyone. It was almost more holy to stay in bed all day and do nothing. The religious leaders formed a list of some 39 main forbidden activities. And these were then proceeded to divide into subdivisions. So all 39 listed tasks are prohibited, as well as any task that operates by the same principle or has the same purpose. To give you an example of some of the subclauses, you may notice numbers three and five. Oops, let me just go back, jump forward. They are reaping and threshing. Obviously, to reap an entire field and to thresh a few bags of wheat would be pretty hard work. So that was an obvious no-no. But the Jews wanted to make sure they knew what the minimum limit was. So subclauses were developed. What were these minimums? Well, to pluck two ears of wheat was considered as reaping. And to rub them was a form of threshing. So you can understand why the Pharisees rebuked the disciples in the time of Christ. To carry an object, the weight of a fig, was to be considered carrying a burden. So hence, when Jesus told a man to carry his bed in John 5, This was considered a gross breach of the Sabbath. Wait, there's more. That's the rest of the list there. It was also considered unlawful to cure on the Sabbath or even to 
apply a remedy unless life was endangered. And this is why we often read in the New Testament that the sick were brought to Christ after sundown. It was even forbidden to use a medication the day before the Sabbath if it produced its effect on the Sabbath day. In the time of Christ, it was allowed to lift an animal out of the pit, but this was later modified so that they weren't permitted to lay hold on the animal and lift it out, although it could be helped out by means of mattresses and cushions or something like that. These examples, and they're not the worst, show the narrowness of the system. It is important to note, though, that all of these Sabbath restrictions are able to be violated if necessary to save a life. Now, originally, travel wasn't a problem, provided it was for religious purposes. For example, travel to a religious meeting or to a friend's house to share a meal. At a later period, however, all movement was restricted to a distance of 2,000 cubits, which is about one to two kilometres, and this became known as a Sabbath day's journey. At the time of the Maccabees, the faithful Jews allowed themselves to be massacred rather than fight on the Sabbath. They soon realised that this wasn't a good idea, and so they decided to only defend themselves if attacked on the Sabbath, although they would not themselves assume the offensive. So what about modern Sabbath laws for the Jews? Well, since the kindling of fire is prohibited, even if it's only a candle, it must therefore follow that turning on an electric light is also a prohibition on the Sabbath. Therefore, part of the preparation for the Sabbath involves unscrewing or removing the light in the refrigerator so it doesn't turn on when you open the fridge. And I'm serious about that. Details are in the slide behind me, but I don't really want to go into all of that for now. Now, I must stress that I'm not giving these examples to make fun of and ridicule the Jews. We firmly believe them to be God's chosen people. These are just examples to show how the, the religious leaders haven't changed their ways since the time of Christ. They've always chosen to focus only on the laws and not to look at the reasons to why they were given. The law was meant to direct their thoughts to Messiah, to Christ. They added more and more laws and sub clauses to God's laws and lost sight of what it was that God wanted them to see. But before we may scoff at some of the things they did, we should pause and consider that we too can still sometimes add new laws to God's laws thinking that we're in some way improving things and possibly making ourselves more righteous. The danger then comes when we try to uphold these man-made laws in the same way as we try to uphold God's laws. In so doing, we too can elevate the practice over the principle. Sadly, our desire to do the right thing can cause a blindness that means we cannot see if we may have drifted from the original intent of what God has provided. Because of this, we need to often and carefully look inwardly at what we're doing to make sure it's still aligned to those principles and practices given to us by God and Christ. We need to be very careful to not inadvertently become latter-day Pharisees. Christ rebuked the self-righteous scribes and Pharisees by telling them in Matthew 23 how that they strain at a gnat and swallow a camel, but that they've admitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. Even today, the religious leaders of the Jews are still bickering over the minutest parts of the law, but they've failed to recognise Christ, God's Son, as the Messiah that they're looking for. We, however, do recognise Christ as being the Son of God, and so now we follow what Christ says. So what then did Christ teach in regards to the law and the Sabbath? If we turn to our reading in Matthew 12 from this evening, we read in verse 1 that at that time... Jesus went on the Sabbath day. Now, it's a good practice when you're looking at a particular verse to look at the other verses around it. If a verse appears to be leading on from another thought, it's often good to go back and gain the flow of that thought. So when we read here at that time, the question must be asked at what time? So we'll start reading from chapter 11 and verse 28. Matthew eleven twenty-eight: Come to me, all you who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Please just keep a marker in Matthew 11 and 12 and turn with me to Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58. 
the children of Israel had turned their worship into a burden that was dragging them down. Their fasting and their Sabbaths were missing the point and they were thus turning into a very heavy yoke, one that was completely the opposite of what God had intended. Isaiah 58 outlines what it was that God wanted them to do. I've got it um, up on the screen from the NIV, which I'll be reading from. Is not this the kind of fasting that I've chosen, this is Isaiah 58 from verse 6, to loose the chains of injustice and to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away your own flesh and blood? Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here am I. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk. Then in verse 13, if you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please on my holy day, if you shall call the Sabbath a delight, and the Lord's holy day honourable, and if you honour it by not going your own way and not doing as you please, or speaking idle words, then you will find joy in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride in triumph on the heights of the land and to feast on the inheritance of your father Jacob. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. The contrast of what God had intended compared to what the Jews had originally, uh, eventually delivered is shown in the symbol of the hand. If you remember back in Deuteronomy 15, uh, 5 verse 15, God gave the symbol of the hand when he introduced the Sabbath, saying he brought them out of Egypt by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. So the Sabbath was to remind them of freedom from slavery. God's hand was stretched out to help them and mighty to save them. But the Jews were only stretching out their hands to point fingers, like in Isaiah 58 verse 9. And this continued in the time of Christ, with the Pharisees constantly pointing at Christ and his disciples to tell them how they were doing everything wrong. But this has also progressed even further. If you go back in verse 4 of Isaiah 58, it shows them not having the hand outstretched to save, but rather it was balled up into a fist, which was then being used to strike their brethren. They had ruined the symbol that God had given in their attempt to appear righteous. Isaiah 58 verse 13 and 14 showed that God's idea of the Sabbath was to be a delight and a joy when they could have time to enjoy their freedom and spend time with their family. But instead, they had turned it into a burden. So come back to Matthew 11, verse 28, where Jesus says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Through the added laws of the Pharisees, the people of Israel were burdened down and overloaded. It made, them, made it hard for them to come to know God in the way that he wanted to become known to them. So what we see here is how Christ is offering a rest for the people, just as the Sabbath was a rest. I think it was in Jesus' mind to show the people around him what God had intended with the Sabbath law in comparison, in comparison to what the Pharisees had imposed. So we read on now in... Matthew 12, verse 1, at that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath and his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. And Luke adds that they ate them, rubbing them with their hands. So that was that reaping and threshing that we spoke of earlier. When the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Now, we know that Jesus never sinned, so therefore he obviously never broke the law. But here we see the Pharisees were accusing Christ of breaking the law. So What's really happening here? The answer is that Christ never broke God's law, but he did break the additional laws imposed by the Pharisees. He broke the laws that had missed the point of God's law and were therefore not true laws. We need to stress this point that Christ never broke God's law, and at the time when he was born, he still lived according to the law of Moses, and he proceeded to do this all of his life. Christ himself said in Matthew 5, verse 17, Do not think I am come to destroy the law or prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. An important difference. There was nothing in the law that was inherently wrong, but it has to be noted that the purpose of the law was to direct the thoughts of the people of Israel to their God 
and ultimately to point them to Christ, their Messiah. Galatians 3 verse 19 says, What purpose does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. So the law was not God's ultimate plan. Christ was. The law was not perfect without Christ, and when Christ fulfilled the law perfectly, there was no place left for such a law that could only bring death. By that I mean the law continually stated, if you do this wrong thing, you shall die. The only punishment recorded in the law for breaking the Sabbath was death. So the only thing that the law could promise was death. But Christ fulfilled the law perfectly and yet he died. And in so doing, Christ ended the chapter of the law. And now God's followers choose to follow Christ and his law. In dying sinless, Christ destroyed the power of sin and God raised him from the dead to everlasting life. Now, just as God had brought the nation of Israel out of Egypt and released them from slavery, the Bible describes how Jesus has opened up a way for men and women to have their own sins forgiven and ultimately to be released from the grip of mortality and death. The Apostle Paul described it like this in Galatians chapter 3, verse 24 and 25. Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, but after faith has come we are no longer under a tutor. So whilst the law was important to the Israelites up to the time of Christ, it has now been superseded by Christ and the laws that he taught. Hebrews 8 verse 13 says, In that he says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Now Christ taught many new laws to the people around him and also to us today. In many ways, Christ's laws are even harder to keep than some of the laws of Moses. For example, in the Ten Commandments, there was a law that said, Thou shalt not kill. Now I'm sure most of us have never killed anyone, and we don't intend to kill anyone in the near future, so we could all feel pretty good about that law. However, when Christ reiterated that law, he added some more information. In Matthew 5.22, Christ said, Whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Now that commandment's a lot harder to keep, and I must confess I've failed in keeping that commandment on more than one occasion. Although I don't think I'll be the only one in the room guilty of that law and others like it. The following list of passages show how that nine of those ten commandments are reaffirmed in the New Testament, but the fourth commandment, that of the Sabbath, isn't reaffirmed anywhere. Rather, I'd put it to you that there are a few verses that show evidence to the contrary. Time won't permit me to go through those verses tonight, but if anyone would like a copy of that list, please see me afterwards. Here's another example of what Christ didn't say from Mark chapter 10 and verse 17 to 19. This is a record where a man, young man came up to him and said, Good master, what shall I do that I shall inherit eternal life? So what did Jesus say in verse 19? He said, Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honour thy father and mother. Now surely this would have been a good opportunity to add the Sabbath if he thought that this was necessary. But it wasn't there. If we can now turn to the, back to the record again in Matthew 12, and this time we'll start looking at verse 5. In Matthew 12, verse 5, when Christ responded to the Pharisees' accusation, he mentioned two instances from the Jewish scriptures. The second one that he pointed out was how that the priests broke the Sabbath every time it was their turn to perform temple services on the Sabbath day. This was because they had duties and sacrifices that they had to do on the Sabbath, many of which would have transgressed a number of the 39 prohibited actions. In fact, they had to work doubly hard on the Sabbath and yet the priests were blameless before God because they were doing God's work. In the same way, Christ was doing God's work, and so he also was blameless. There were a number of times when Christ deliberately chose to heal on the Sabbath. Seven of those are listed on the screen, but we're only going to be looking at the one which we read about in our reading, that being the man with the withered hand in Matthew 12, verses 9 to 14. Now, this is a time when Christ deliberately healed on the Sabbath. He could have waited a few hours and done it after the Sabbath had ended, but he chose to do these miracles on the Sabbath in defiance of the Pharisees' man-made laws. So what was wrong with this man? He had a withered hand. This wasn't a life-threatening illness. Under the law of the Pharisees, there was no need for something to be done about it on the Sabbath. 
We don't know exactly what was wrong with the man's hand or how long it had been that way, but it was withered, shriveled. This was a hand that was not able to reach out. It was a hand that was not able to do those things that were listed in Isaiah 58, to loose the burdens, to deal bread to the hungry, or to clothe the naked. So this man was symbolic of the nation of Israel, with a hand so shrunken and withered that it was probably more like a fist. It was, a, it was symbolic of a nation so bound up in the practice of the law that they were unable to follow the principle of the law. So their hand was worthless and not of any use apart from possibly to oppress others. So Christ opened the question as to what people could do on the Sabbath. He reminded them that it was lawful to help others and to do good on the Sabbath. Rather than be burdened like the Pharisees by what he couldn't do, he chose to show them what they should be doing in opening their hands to help others and remove the burdens of others. So what did Jesus tell him to do? Did he say to him, you're healed or your sins are forgiven, as he did on other occasions? No. Rather, in this time, he told the man to stretch out his hand. God wanted the people to see the significance of, uh, he wanted the people to see the significance of what God had said in Deuteronomy 5, how that God would save them with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. So Christ, as the Lord of the Sabbath, was able to transform the man from having a withered and useless hand, like the Pharisees' burdensome Sabbath laws, to having a powerful outstretched hand, just as God had wanted, able to do good, able to loose those burdens. Without Christ, this man would never have been able to help others. But now through Christ, he was able to help, just as we're enabled to do so much more through Christ. But even after this, we still see the hard-heartedness of the Pharisees who, despite having just witnessed a miracle, still sought to destroy Jesus. So then what kind of example did Christ set on the Sabbath? The Bible never says that he rested. We're actually only told of his activity. Many of the occasions that are reported of Christ healing people were on the Sabbath. And added to that, Christ never commanded anyone to keep the Sabbath, nor praised anyone for keeping it. Rather, he's recorded as constantly criticising people who had rules about what could or could not be done on the Sabbath. Also, Christ not only broke the Pharisees' rules for the Sabbath by healing people, he also encouraged other people to break these rules, as shown when he healed the lame man and then told him to carry his bed home on the Sabbath. Bearing in mind again that this was um, much heavier than carrying a fig, which was what they'd set their limit to. Further to this, it's obvious from the life of Jesus that he never set aside any special day for rest. To him, every day was a day that could and should be used to praise God, and we also should have that same attitude. John, 15, uh, John 5 verse 17 says how that Jesus said, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Now David Levin, a Christadelphian writer, puts it this way in his book, Legalism and Faith. My father is still working means God has never rested. On the seventh day of creation, with the work of creation finished, he ceased from his creative working, but he never stopped maintaining his creation. Since the beginning, the work of saving and rescuing his people has been a full-time, seven-day-a-week job. He always hears prayers. He always forgives, restores, sustains, cares for, and upholds his creation and all that dwell in it. Did the Jews ever consider that creator God was also maintainer God. God never stopped working. If he did, earth would have ended on the seventh day. So just as God never really stopped working, even on the Sabbath, and just as the priests had to work doubly hard on the Sabbath, even so Christ also worked doubly hard on the Sabbath in the order that God might be glorified. So Christ's teaching can be briefly summarised as followed. The Jews had forgotten the real purpose of the Sabbath. It was lost in a mass of petty rules and regulations which they had devised. In short, they couldn't see the forest because of all the trees. Jesus, in his teaching and his miracles, declared the real purpose of the Sabbath. It was to show that God's purpose involves freeing men and women from slavery to sin and death so that they can serve him. There was no better day for him to do God's work on than on the Sabbath. And lastly, the Sabbath was a weekly reminder of these things, but Jesus lived this way every day throughout his life. The next section I'd like to look at is how the apostles regarded the Sabbath. These were Christ's closest companions, the one who he'd spent most of his ministry with. 
the ones he taught perfectly about God's ways. They've been told by Christ just before he ascended to heaven how that they were to go throughout all the world and teach people about Christ and the coming kingdom of God. But they were told that they were to teach firstly to the Jewish people throughout the world and then after that to the Gentiles, the other nations. Because of this, we read on many occasions how the apostles would preach on the Sabbath and also go to the synagogues. Some Sabbath worshippers would say this proves that the apostles worshipped on the Sabbath. But I'd suggest that this wasn't because of any regard that they had for the Sabbath, but rather it was merely a convenience as they'd been commanded to preach to the Jews first. If they wanted to preach to the Jews, the easiest way to find them was to look in the synagogues on the Sabbath day. This became very evident when you look at the passages that mention the Sabbath and the apostles preaching at that time. They always mention how that the apostles were either preaching to new converts or reasoning from the scriptures, which could be loosely translated as debating their beliefs with the Jews who refused to believe in Christ and wanted to continue following the law. Rather than meeting together on the Sabbath day to worship, it appears the apostles adopted a different pattern of worship. Before his death, Christ had commanded his disciples to meet together to eat bread and drink wine as a memorial to him until he returned again. In Acts 20 verse 7, we see an example of this memorial which was referred to as the breaking of bread. Acts 20 verse 7, now on the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. Now, it appears from a few references that this was the custom of the disciples to meet on this first day of the week. There's a few suggestions as to why this was so. The most obvious is that they were remembering their risen Lord on the day that he rose from the dead. The record shows in many occasions how that Christ rose from the dead on the first day of the week, and that is only one of them when Mary Magdalene first saw Jesus early on the first day of the week. So then Christ rose to life on the first day of the week. That was one reason as to why the first century believers worshipped on the first day. But the other reason I believe is this. You'll remember from the Acts 20 reference they'd gotten together to break bread and then Paul talked until midnight. So it appears from this that when they met together, it may have been after 6 o'clock on the Saturday night. This would make sense if the disciples preached in the synagogue on the Sabbath and then when the Sabbath ended and all the Jews left, they reconvened at somebody's house in order to share a meal and break bread to remember the Lord. So while it was sat, still Saturday in our modern time, it was also the first day of the week, the day that the Lord had risen. But while it's evident the apostles didn't keep the Sabbath, there were a few people who did want to go back to following the law of Moses, and this caused quite a lot of bother for the apostles. In Galatians 4, verse 9 to 11, Paul took it upon himself to address this issue specifically. I'll just paraphrase what's up on the screen behind me. Now that you've come to know God, why do you want to turn back to the weak and beggarly elements? Why do you want to lock yourself up in the law again? You're observing days, months, times and years. I'm afraid it seems all my teaching has been a waste of time. That's a bit of a crude paraphrase, but I'm sure it gets the message across. So this is not to say that no one should keep the Sabbath, and doubtless there would have been believers at the time of the apostles who wanted to continue with Sabbath worship. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 14. Romans 14, verse 5 to 6. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. And he who does not observe the day, to the Lord he does not observe it. So even now, if someone wanted to set aside a special day to dedicate themselves to God, that's not a bad thing to do. Spiritual disciplines like that can be helpful to a person's spiritual growth. But however, they can also become obstacles if people begin to think that these particular practices could possibly make them better than others. We're not in any way to judge or to look down on any other person who may not see things quite the same way as we do. Colossians 2 verse 16 and 17 says, Let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. So that's an area where it clearly shows that the Sabbath, among other things, was to point people to Christ, the Messiah. But now that Christ had appeared, 
they were no longer to have a need to focus on the things that were there to direct them to Christ. So whilst we have the freedom to do as we please, we cannot impose things like Sabbath keeping on other people. And also, if by keeping the Sabbath you neglect the welfare of your loved ones around you, you may well have missed the point of Christ's teaching. Notwithstanding, there are some Christians who still keep the Sabbath. Also, some Christians think that by worshipping on Sunday, they are keeping some sort of New Testament Sabbath. The Roman Catholics have gone so far as to say that the Sabbath is now actually Sunday, which is completely incorrect. The Sabbath is Saturday and Sunday is the first day of the week and that's the way it's always been and we should never confuse it. But some Christadelphians also seem to hold to an idea that Sunday is in some way a new holy day and that we should limit what we do on it. I'm sure its basis is well-meaning, but it's not within the teachings of Christ. I remember when I was younger, I was told by somebody that it was wrong to go to the beach and go surfing on a Sunday as it was the Lord's Day. I think I said something like, oh, I see, and then still went anyway. But we do need to be careful not to inadvertently follow man-made laws or errors of false religion, nor should we lapse into the repetition of the errors of those well-meaning Jews who spent so much time working out what they couldn't do that they lost sight of what they should be doing. So whilst we as Christadelphians meet for our breaking of bread on Sunday, this is as much because it's a day free from possible distractions of work as much as anything else. We're not also bound to break bread only once a week. Christ has told us to break bread as often as we meet together in remembrance of him. In the mission fields, I've had a time where due to travel arrangements, I've broken bread with different people on Sunday, Wednesday, Friday, and then Sunday again. In some countries, Christadelphians meet on Fridays as that's a more convenient time for them. So the breaking of bread is not confined to any one day. Since Sunday is not a normal working day, it's sensible to arrange meetings for worship on that day. Yet it must always be remembered that God does not command it. While Christian believers should meet regularly to remember Christ's sacrifice, there are no direct commands exactly when they should do so. It's more crucial to remember regularly what Christ achieved than to make an issue about what day the memorial should be kept. So then to summarise the Apostles' teaching regarding the Sabbath, the Apostles used the Sabbath as a convenient time to preach to other Jews. Christ's followers broke bread on the first day of the week, remembering Christ's resurrection. The Apostles experienced many problems with people wanting to return to following the law of Moses. The Apostles went to great pains to show that the law of Moses was now obsolete superseded by Christ, and that now people had to follow Christ's laws instead. And lastly, even if you still did choose to keep a personal Sabbath, you mustn't condemn another person for not keeping the Sabbath. The next thing I want to look at is the phrase, the Lord's Day. I've heard the term, the Lord's Day, used by both people proclaiming the Sabbath and also people promoting Sunday worship. The Lord's Day refers neither to Saturday nor Sunday, necessarily, but rather to the day of the Lord's return when he will set up the kingdom. This quote and almost 30 others throughout the Bible support this claim. As to what day that is, no one knows save God in Christ. All we know is that it will be very soon. Speaking then of the Lord's day, there is one final aspect of the Sabbath to consider. If we could please turn to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9 to 10. When writing to the Jews who had left the law of Moses behind and become brethren in Christ, Paul the Apostle wrote about the Sabbath provision in a fascinating way that draws together many of the different things we have discussed tonight. Hebrews 4 verse 9 and 10 reads, There remains therefore a rest for the people of God, for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Now, you may remember how I mentioned that God rested on the seventh day of creation. This wasn't because God physically needed a rest, because he was tired. Rather, he was initiating a type or a symbol. Creation took place over six days with one final day of rest, which is the Sabbath. Now, you may well know the phrase that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. Well, we know that God has a great 7,000 year plan with this earth. And he's been working toward that plan over the last approximately 6,000 years. If you look back at 4,000 BC, 
is approximately the time of creation according to the Bible record. The real rest of God is therefore something which is yet to come. It will be a time when God's will is done perfectly on earth as it is in heaven, just as Jesus taught us to pray. We know this rest will be the kingdom of God, which will last 1,000 years. We know that God has promised his kingdom as a reward for those people who truly love him and his son, Jesus Christ. Revelation 20 verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So Jesus Christ will be the king of this kingdom soon to come. He'll truly be the Lord of the Sabbath, the thousand-year Sabbath rest that's been promised by God from the time of creation. And he desires that every one of us here tonight will be there in that kingdom with him. So this is the Sabbath rest that we are looking forward to. Although, like the priests in the times of the children of Israel, the saints will likely be working very hard. But those who have been faithful will have the burden, the yoke of sin removed from them, which will make it a wonderful time for us to enjoy. And like the Sabbath days in the time of the law, we'll have a wonderful opportunity to fellowship and worship with those we love. So then as a final summary, the Sabbath was an institution specifically for the nation of Israel. The Sabbath was a part of the law of Moses, which has been superseded by Christ and is no longer binding. Christ taught us that we should be serving God every day of the week, not just on any one chosen day. And the Sabbath points us toward the kingdom of God and the 1,000-year rest under the rule of Christ. So then, is the Sabbath important? Well, the answer is yes, it is, but it's the lesson of the Sabbath that is important rather than the day itself. Should we keep the Sabbath? The answer to that is that the Bible has not recorded any time that Christ has commanded us to do that, but rather he's encouraged us to follow his example by living every day in service to God. I thank you all for your time tonight. Sorry it went a bit longer than we to cover. And I do pray that by God's grace, when our Lord returns to set up the kingdom and begin the true Sabbath rest, we, we will all be part of it, serving God this morning.